I grew up in a very small industrial town in the English Midlands, coal mining town essentially, and I was the only boy in the boys' school I was at that was interested in art. Art school was very different then. England was still recovering from the after effects of the war. A lot of the lecturers were old. I was fascinated by painters like Mondrian, Kandinsky and Jackson Pollock, who were very, very much frowned upon by the, the staff of the art school. I was fascinated by an interaction between geometry and landscape, which seems to have been one of the major threads in my work through the whole of my life. We were encouraged to draw a lot, and so most of the painting came from observation and then some sort of imaginative interpretation of that observation. When we arrived, we didn't have anywhere to live, and we, we were told that there was a place called South Lee, and I found myself in an environment where the light was so totally different to the light of the industrial Midlands of England, much clearer, much brighter, much sharper, and I was surrounded by paddocks and bush and a sense of growth and a sense of organic energy. I still look back on that time at South Lee as one of the most important times in my painting career. You've got to imagine a very, very different Tasmania, a much smaller arts environment. And after uh, six months of teaching at Newtown High School, I must have made enough nuisance of myself that the education department got me a job at the art school. And gradually I built up what we first called the two-dimensional studies program that became the basis of the old foundation course at the art school. I think teaching has always influenced my work. I'd been placing a lot of emphasis on encouraging the students to explore colour and the theories of colour and I used Joseph Albers and Itten and the Bauhaus as the basis of a lot of what I wanted to do and that encouraged me to explore colour. The Jane Franklin Hall Commission was a very interesting challenge. They came up with an amazing proportion. It was four feet high and ten feet long. And could I use, as the main colours, red, silver and blue? And I thought, oh my God, that's a bit of a challenge. Red, silver and blue. It doesn't fit in exactly with what I'd been using before. I'd never explored the possibilities of metallic paint before. And I suddenly realised that here was a pigment that worked in a slightly different way, in that it reflected direct light much more than it reflected indirect light. Even until relatively recently, occasionally, I've come back and used metallic pigment in my work, and it all came out of that commission. There's always been the potential for shift and change. Having worked through this period of very, very rigid geometry, I began to realise that I needed somehow or other to puncture that with the introduction of a more organic quality. In a sense, I suppose, the work has continually shifted around that series of relationships ever since, often being 
inspired by a particular place or a particular event. I think the most powerful one was the trip to Bathurst Harbour. The sense of the wildness of that place was astonishing. The sheer drama of the place just powerfully affected me. So while I was down there, I drew and I drew and I took photographs and I came back and I thought, now somehow or other, I'm gonna paint this. But I didn't know how to paint it. And you know, how do you paint something that's as epic as that? I spent six months mucking around and nothing satisfied me. And then I remembered a little story about Kandinsky and he'd been working in his studio all day and he decided that he needed a break. So he went out and had a meal and had something to drink and came back. And when he opened the door of the studio, he saw at the bottom of his easel this strange painting that at first he didn't recognise. And of course it was what he'd been working on, but it had fallen down and turned upside down. And I thought, well, maybe I can learn something from that. So I worked on the Bathurst Harbour landscape and then turned it over and then began to repaint recreate horizon lines, mountain lines, cloud lines, rain, sun, blues, greys. And I thought, that's the way in. It's marvellous how a little thing like that can transform you. I tend to use references that are very close to me. I've got an enormous collection of shells and bird skulls and bones and feathers and things like that. And I will go through this collection and, until I find two or three objects that seem to have some sort of relationship to each other. A shell and a bird skull, for instance, and use those as the basis of the drawing. I love shells that are broken so you can see their internal structure. And I think it's that combination of the geometry and the organic. The one thing that I've tried to avoid is a sense of style. I think the worst thing that any creative person can do is to feel that they've created a style for themselves and this is how they are going to work. I think you have to keep an openness in your work and if something says, look, this is what you should be playing with now, then play with it. I used to use collages a lot with my first year students in the foundation program. And I thought, well, why not see if I can somehow or other rethink it in relation to my own work. And so I started playing with it. They started off very formally and gradually I realized I could break that formal quality down and start to explore a little bit more. I could introduce all sorts of elements that I discovered simply by collecting books and magazines that I was going to destroy for the purposes of collage. I was a bit like a magpie, picking through all this material. In one of those collages, I've used three beautiful guinea fowl feathers when I put three of them together, it makes the most wonderful rhythmic pattern. 
I've always been aware of this sense of the rhythms and patterns and cycles of landscape. Sometimes I love the ephemerality of a dead leaf hanging from a spider's web, whereas immediately behind it are the solidity of huge gum trees. And I think one of the beauties of landscape is all the extraordinary variation. So you're not always sure quite what you're looking at is solid or being blown away by the next gust of wind. But gradually, the geometry started to break apart. I started experimenting far more with torn edges, sometimes printing natural materials onto the papers. And it was amazing how the collage opened another door. The first indication was um, it was kidney cancer and I had the kidney removed and the general feeling at the time was that we got it. It had been done fairly quickly, everything should be okay, but unfortunately it didn't work out like that. I'd been in hospital for oh, about 10 days and Jenny bought me a little mirror and my sketchbook. So that was the next step to create a small self-portrait locate that on a canvas and then move away from that. Often, not in a direct way, but in an indirect way, trying to make a connection with some of the sorts of treatments and things that had gone on within the hospital. And slowly, I could sense that my body was getting weaker and weaker and weaker. Without the studio and the materials and being here and having this environment, I think I would have become terribly despondent and art has helped me to, at times, forget the problems of the cancer and if not necessarily forget, to separate myself a little bit from it. I think if an idea is growing within you, it's best not to resist it because it's trying to tell you something. Look at the, uh, the four paintings that I painted when Dick Jones died. I wouldn't fight an idea if it's dark or okay. game. It's going to be dark, but the next one may not be, and life goes on. I don't want to be seen as observing the landscape. I want to be seen as part of it, integrated into it. I don't want that clinical, dispassionate view I hope that everything I do contains an element of me and I hope that that comes through in the work. I don't think I really know how the experience translates into the art. I just hope that somehow or other it does. And I think that's really what I'm on about, trying to turn experience into something worth looking at. One of the nicest things that anybody can ever say to me is that 
I keep seeing new things in your work. If they can tell me that, then I know that my work is still alive. 